This evening I'm going to talk to Mitch Feierstein, who's a hedge fund dealer. Not a category we normally have on this show, but he's different. A, he knows how the system works. B, he thinks it isn't working. And C, he thinks that if the politicians carry on like this, the system might well crash again very soon. Mitch Feierstein's book, Planet Ponzi, how the world got into this mess, what happens next, how to save yourself, uh, is written for the layperson. Anyone can pick it up and read it, and you get a much better idea of what's been happening with the financialized economy since 2008 and even before that than in almost any other work I've read except academic works, which are interesting, some of them are important, but are virtually incomprehensible for the layperson. Mitch, welcome. Thanks Very for good me. to have you with us. Um, tell me a bit how you got into this uh, business. Well, when I left university back in the dark ages when they barely had electricity, um, I decided to work on Wall Street. And I wrote Planet Ponzi because I was consulting a couple of governments. And I thought that it was important that they let the banks fail during the credit crisis. Because one of my best lines, I think, is um, heads I win, tails you bail me out. That's not capitalism, that's extortion. So I think we've gotten into a situation where a lot of the banks have ha used too much credit, too much debt, and too much leverage. That's what got us into the problem to begin with. And I think now, from 2007 to 8 to today, the leverage is more, the debt is more, and the credit is more. Basically, your argument is that when the crisis happened, uh, the bailouts in themselves were a disaster, and it would have been better to let quite a lot of banks go to the wall and let the economy start afresh than using taxpayers' money to bail them out. Well, that's a controversial thesis. I happen to agree with you, but most people don't. And the main worry here is, if this had happened, what would have happened to the small investors, people who just put their money in a bank not knowing where this money is going or what happens to it? Well, that's a great point. Now, we have a precedent in the mid-'80s when I first started in the business. It's probably before a lot of people's times. It was called the, the savings and loan crisis in America. I remember that. So when all of those thrifts went bust, the ordinary saver who had their money in the bank or the institution, the thrift or savings and loan, got their money back because it was guaranteed up to a certain threshold. Oh. That's the same thing with everywhere around Europe and the United States now. You've got to look and see what the institution has in terms of insurance, but I think what they've adopted now in Europe is the, what I call the Cyprus model. Now, we're all aware of what happened in Cyprus when they went in and they seized everyone's assets above 85,000. So a lot of people who had their life savings were wiped out because they only got recovery of 85,000. And then they implemented capital controls, which got really dicey. And I think that that's the model that they're going to use next time. So I think in addition to stealing from savers, this is the added kick so next time it's going to be bail-ins and they're just going to confiscate. It's going to be sanctioned deposit confiscation, in my view. Explain to me how, in your opinion, this crisis erupted and whether or not it could have been prevented. How come that apart from a few people, no one really saw it coming or no one thought that the Wall Street crash would be on such a scale? I disagree. I think that's media propaganda and a narrative that nobody could have seen it coming. Mm -hmm. I think the beginning of the end well, it came down to three guys, Robert Rubin, Larry Summers, and um, Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton got rid of Glass-Steagall, yes. which allowed for securitizations, which allowed for these crazy structures. So if you go back and look at a, a chart of leverage, starting when Glass-Steagall was wiped off the books, you can see that it's just straight up, and that's when things started to spiral. Last out of Eagle control. is the well, regulatory act, yeah. Right, it was a regulatory act that made um, investment banks have a separate entity so they couldn't package together bundles of debt and make it bigger and bigger and bigger. And because Clinton it, decided to get rid well, of that. Right, in 1999, on the basis of Robert Rubin, who was the ex Treasury Secretary, 
and Larry Summers, who is his close advisor. Larry was uh, worked for Rubin, then he worked for Bill Clinton on several separate occasions. And Larry keeps reappearing everywhere like a bad penny. He's, uh, he's at Harvard, back to Harvard now, and he tried to become the chairman of the Fed. And people don't remember. They have a very short memory for volatility and a very short memory for the problems that people caused in the markets going back. So I think it's important that we look at history. So the origins of the crisis lay in deregulation, removing all restraints on the banks. This meant the merger of retail and investment banks. And this meant that banks could raise any amount of money and lend even more. But isn't that what banks usually do? Well, ba the bank's job is to create money by lending to small businesses. Now, when they create, the problem is not with debt. I don't have a problem with debt, but I have a problem with a lot of the structures because there are structures now called derivative products, which are options, and they can be a little complicated. Alan Greenspan said that it's apparent that there was fraud committed. We do not need new regulations. We need existing regulations to be enforced, and we need it to be enforced firmly. So he was the former chairman of the Federal Reserve saying that. So that should tell you that the system has numerous problems that need to be addressed. And perhaps you need to have people who think out of the box come in and help out with that, which we haven't had. <clears throat> and were the Enron crash and then the whole Madoff affair serious warnings which were ignored? Well, I think, you know, Enron was the biggest corporate bankruptcy in history, and it was based on fraud. Now, Madoff was another fraud, but my book, Planet Ponzi, talks about the global structure of the government debt being a fraud. Because even in Japan recently, as you know, on Halloween, they decided to do another money printing um, endeavor, which was voted five to four, so it was a very close vote. It almost got rejected. Mm -hmm. But the important takeaway is the person, the advisor to Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, who created this policy of Abenomics, said that we're involved in a mild Ponzi game. And the way that he described it was, it's okay, the exact quote was, it's okay as long as taxpayers don't revolt. When the government issues tons of debt, they print money to buy their own debt, it becomes a Ponzi scheme because there's nothing to back it. Eventually you hit a wall. And I think what happens is you get a tremendous amount more debt, like 500% of debt to GDP. So when the revenues, the tax revenues come in, you're using 60 cents of every dollar just to service the interest payments on your debt, which is growing and growing and growing with interest rates at 500-year lows. I mean, interest rates are almost at zero. So it doesn't take a genius to figure out that when interest rates go up marginally, which they have to eventually, then you have credit defaults and the inability to pay or service the debt or even the interest on the debt. Because in fact, uh, a number of politicians, nervous, defensive, when asked, do you think there is going to be another crash like the Wall Street one? Find it difficult to deny this. But yet they said no. They put sticking plaster on it, even though they could see the blood still coming out. And they said, well, let's have another try. Because there were no huge protests in the United States from below or in this country. But now protests from below are reaching fever pitch in countries like Greece and in countries like Spain with new parties poised to come to a government. Is that what it'll take then globally for certain structural reforms to take place within the system? Well, I think you're right 100% once again on, on this. I think France you need to add to the fray as okay. well because France is probably the most insolvent of any of these countries and Italy. Yeah. Italy's GDP came out this morning which was another shocker. So in six years, I think Italy's only had um, two or three positive quarters of GDP. F from 2000 to present, there are only two countries in the world, Haiti and Zimbabwe, that have had worse growth than Italy. And Italy 
has 2.9 trillion in debt that they've issued that they can probably not repay. So they've got um, 30 plus percent unemployment, probably 45 percent youth unemployment. The issue, as you've highlighted, is that when you disenfranchise future generations, which is what we've done, we're borrowing from the futures of the students and the children and the savers to take a payout for CEOs today, it can end very badly. And I think you're seeing the seeds of civil unrest in the protest movements that we're getting right now. Is there a one-size-fits-all solution? Probably not. But when the rhetoric and the narrative that the politicians come out with says, well, we're reducing the deficit. We're not reducing the debt because the debt's been going up and up and up. You hear this all the time from the parties running for office in the UK, that we're reducing the deficit. That's just the amount above the revenues that you're making, that you're spending. So in other words, a, a, a good way to put this is my wife went out to Chanel and she <laughs> said, honey, we saved 100,000 pounds today. Oh, really? How'd we do that? That's really good. Well, I bought a dress on sale for 100,000 pounds. It was originally 200,000 pounds. <laughs> I said, but wait a second, we didn't save anything. I don't have 100,000 pounds for a dress right now, but we saved 100,000. So that's the same way that they're cutting the deficit. They're spending money that they don't have, but less of it. But since we don't hold anybody to account these days, you know, you can just run roughshod and you can come in and make any promises you want just to be reelected. And linked to this, <clears throat> I think what we're also seeing is a real uh, crisis for democracy. Because if you have, like in the US to a large extent, two parties which pander to the same financial interests, this system has now been spreading towards Europe via Britain. All three political parties in Parliament basically say the same thing on the economy. So large numbers of people, especially young people, are saying, well, why should the hell should we go and vote? If, you know, there's a very funny slogan written on a wall in London for the last election, if voting changed anything, they'd abolish it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. I mean, and in Spain and in uh, Greece, we've seen a big challenge to this extreme center, which I call it, which rules these countries, with new parties emerging. Nothing here so far, and in Italy this, and France, the situation is dire on that front. But short of that, I mean, the system is not just in economic crisis, it's also in a deep crisis of political accountability. I think democracy is vaporized. I don't think democracy exists anymore. I think it's an <coughs> illusion. Um, you know, you see that the Tory party came out, and Theresa May, who's got aspirations of being the next prime minister, you know, it's totally apparent that you know, what their secondary agenda might be. Um, with all these scaremongering facts about terrorist potential strikes, 40 that we saved, but please allow us to implement these draconian police state quality laws that will let us listen to all of your phone calls, all of your private conversations, and all of your text messages. Now, quite frankly, that's up to the, a judge, in my view, and a court system to come up and say, look, if we really believe that, we're going to get a warrant and we're going to do this the right way. We're not as just, they used to. Yeah, as they used to. But that's right out the window. It's like, no, 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 we've got a new system in place. So going back to what you said about new parties, yes, you're getting a lot of fringe parties in Greece that are, that are very extreme and fascist. You know, it, uh, an uprise to a Nazi-type extremism party parties, and that happens whenever the economy goes down in a country. You have a rise to this. Um, you're seeing that in a couple of the Eastern European countries. Hungary, Ex for instance. Right. Hungary is one, and Ukraine is, is another, the other, yeah. which the United States engineered a takeover of the government, which yeah. was, you know, it, it's kind of very confusing as to the hypocrisy behind that entire situation. But I think where the hope is, is you, you know, you can get a group like UKIP that can come in who haven't had the opportunity or get a, a third party that hasn't been around. And people are going to have to say, look, I'm going to have to give somebody else a shot because, you know, I don't know who it's going to be that's going to be the dominant third party, but there will be one, whether it's this time, whether it's next time. But you can't keep, and, and I point this out in the book, I say it several times, and I'll repeat it here, that you can't keep voting for people who have lied to you. Mitch, you give a figure here which says it all in a way. 
<coughs> which is that the Iraq war cost three trillion dollars and then George Bush pushed through three trillion dollars tax cuts. So six trillion dollars, half lost in a completely insane war in Iraq and the others a gift to the haves and the have-mores, as Bush put it, if you remember. I mean, but this is crazy. But that's not, you see, that's, that's not a tax cut, really, and I think I go into in further yeah. detail. It's a deferment. Yes. So what it means is they're borrowing against future, future earnings. Now, the biggest part of the problem here is that um, global GDP is about $67 trillion mm -hmm. a year. So if you think about the U.S. debt, which right now is about to tick over to 18 trillion, but mm -hmm. the total amount of U.S. debt is over 225 trillion dollars. Staggering. That is staggering. I mean, had it been any other country, the IMF would have been in, the World Bank would have been in, either you cut it down or we're going to impose A, B, C, but because it's the U.S., no one can do anything. <laughs> That's exactly right. But the problem with the debt that they've accrued, a lot of it is in future entitlement programs like Medicare, Medicaid. So they, the way that they account for, the, for the, that debt, I go into it in detail, is, is kind of confusing and a little bit murky. But yeah. that debt is there and there are real obligations to pay for future generations. But it's going to be problematic because a lot of the debt has been achieved in the past seven years. Now, if you go back and look at interest rates, interest rates hit a cyclical peak in 1981, and they've come straight down since then. So a big, part, a big part of the problem is that most of the kids who are trading in today's Wall Street market and in the city of London and everywhere else around the world have no idea what a bear market is because for their entire careers, all they've seen are good times and seen interest rates going down. So nobody believes interest rates can ever go up. What could possibly go wrong with that scenario? I mean, interest rates are going to have to go up. And the fantasy that people keep telling us that there's no inflation, I mean, think about a house price, okay? House prices in London, are it's probably the biggest bubble on the planet that you can equate it to the tulip mania in Holland back in whenever it was, several hundred years ago. Hmm. I mean, the prices are, are nuts. And the increase was 500% in the last seven or eight years, I think, in pockets of central London. In 2013, I think one in every four jobs that was created was in the property sector. So that's what we are seeing in the UK. I mean, it's a bubble that's driven by a bubble. So the only recovery we're seeing, I think, uh, can disappear and vanish very quickly. In your book you write, and I just want to th throw this back at you, hundreds of trillions of dollars worth of financial contracts are linked to the LIBOR rate. Hundreds of trillions. And Barclays Bank, along with plenty of others, manipulated those markets to their own advantage. And then you say, surely this is the biggest fraud in history. Explain that, Mitch, to our viewers. Yeah, I, I I actually... After what is the LIBOR rate? Right, first? The LIBOR rate is a London interbank offered rate. Yeah. So it is the rate that determines what interest rates are being charged to individuals on their mortgage products, on every product, every loan product in the world uses a LIBOR fix generally. And so there are so many trillions, hundreds of trillions and trillions of dollars that use this fix. That even if you have a tiny manipulation in that rate, it's going to mean hundreds of millions of dollars in profits for the banks that can manipulate that rate because there are so many settings that they have off the back of it. Now when the book originally came out, I did an interview on one of the mainstream media television shows and the um, commentator said, you actually expect me to believe that banks were engaged in criminality? <laughs> I said, and I, I, he looked at me and I, I was thinking to myself, you can't really be serious with that, right? But I just said calmly, I said, okay, but yes they were. And he goes, well, I want to know which banks, and I want to know who should be banged up, mate. And I said, look, I said, that's not my job. That's what we have regulators for, and regulators should be watching out for these things. I'm not a regulator, so it's not my responsibility. Now, I can point out that there have been 
there has been malfeasance in several markets. LIBOR is one of them. And then, of course, after this foreign exchange manipulation came out, the gold markets are terribly manipulated by almost every government in the world. And now the derivatives market, as, as I point out in there, is probably close to a quadrillion dollars, which is, it's, it, it, it's staggering. I mean, um, a bank such as J.P. Morgan or Deutsche Bank has more than global GDP, about 72 or $73 trillion in derivative products on their balance sheet. Look, there's no reason why you should have a um, derivatives book that's bigger than global GDP. Somebody's got to step in and say, look, we're going to unwind that in an orderly manner, and that's what should be done. One of your chapters, <coughs> quite provocatively, is called What is to be Done? And you say that you derived the title from Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, the leader of the Russian Revolution. Um, what made you turn to Lenin in this particular crisis? Well, I mean, I think that there are a lot of, as, as I mentioned a little earlier in the interview, that we can learn a lot from history. The unfortunate part of that is history always repeats itself and nobody learns a lesson. Nothing in there is conspiracy theory, it's all facts. And when you, you present facts to people, they become extremely uncomfortable, especially if it conflicts with their narrative. That's why mainstream media doesn't really necessarily like to portray how dire the situation may be. Now, is there a way out? Of course there's a way out, but is it gonna be an easy way out? No, it's not. In 2007, had we let a lot of these um, institutions go to the wall, we would have been way on the uh, road to recovery at this point in time. But unfortunately, we decided to double, triple, and quadruple down on a bad bet. Mitch, let's say that Greece elects a Syriza government, <clears throat> which is a new party on the left, currently at top of the polls, just like Podemos in Spain. Let's say that these parties come to power and form a government. And the prime ministers of, the new prime ministers of Spain and Greece ring you up and say, Mr. Feinstein, we've seen your book, we're in a mess. The European Union is in a mess. We've got all these debts imposed on us. Troika, the Troika is refusing to let us act. What should we do? What would be your advice to them? Well, I don't know if it would be my advice. What I would predict is going to happen. Yeah. Um, is that they're going to repudiate their debt and they're going to leave the EU. I think the EU is a failed project. Despite the hot air that's being spewed out of yeah. Mario Draghi, who was ex-Goldman that convinced Italy when he was the head of the Bank of Italy, and he, he was affiliated tightly with Goldman to issue all that debt that they can never repay, I don't think they can bail it out. I don't even know what number bailout Greece is on. Uh, what is it, six, seven, eight? Yeah. And, but they still need more money. This yeah. is the point. They haven't gotten any further away from that. Spain's basket case, France is really bad. And I, I don't know if you're aware, but the political party of the day of the flavor of the month is Marie Le Pen. I know, I and, know. And her platform, the first thing she said that she would do is she would have a referendum on leaving the EU and repudiating the debt. So, I mean, her... You've got Beppe Grillo in Italy, the five-star program. He wants to put now, he's got a bunch of people in Parliament in Italy. He wants to put an amendment in front of the Parliament to leave the EU and repudiate the debt. So I don't know, you know, I'm not a smart enough guy to figure out who's going to leave first, but I can tell you something. Somebody will leave first. As you know, all of these countries that we mentioned are going to miss their budget targets. And so they just said, so? Okay, well, we're going to let it go this time. This time, they've been letting it go before, I mean, money printing, when you print money, there's going to be unintended consequences. We just haven't seen, seen how it's impacted everything yet. You know, we're seeing hyperinflation in London, in the property market, and in other select asset classes. I mean, Uber is an example. The NASDAQ 2.0 bubble, $40 billion valuation for that company. Or, you know, even a, a company, everybody has a smartphone, WhatsApp. Facebook paid the equivalent of $23 billion for a texting company that doesn't make any revenue. Zero revenue, and they paid $23 billion for it. So it's, it's, we're in some incredibly bizarre times. I mean, in my 35-year career in banking, I've never seen anything like it. I mean, Facebook's valuation 
is $218 billion, billion dollars. I don't understand the revenue model at all. Apple is touted as the first trillion dollar market cap. Now great, Apple has terrific products, but at the end of the day, it's a technology company with a very low barrier to entry, so anybody can get in there. Their market cap is over $700 billion right now. It's absolutely staggering, but all this money that the governments have printed, the $100 trillion in bailouts and ancillary guarantees over the past seven years has just created monstrous bubbles of epic proportion that nobody wants to talk about, and that can never end well. It cannot be a happy ending, unfortunately. Two questions related to that, Mitch. One, Germany, the German economy. Its state, likely development, especially if there is a collapse of the euro. Well, I, Germany might be the first to leave the euro. I mean, we don't really know what, what the agenda is, or it could be the for, Fourth Reich running all of Europe. Quite frankly, their PMI came out today, which is an indication of how their manufacturing output is going. I know it's a technical term, yeah. <clears throat> but it came out below 50, which means the economy is, is in a contraction for the first time in a long time. You know, all of the economic modeling shows that there's a, a good probability of a recession happening in Europe, which is going to impact everybody. I mean, real wages in the UK for seven years have gone down. Yes. I mean, we've got to keep that in mind. So I don't know how you can have real wages going down and house prices skyrocketing. So, I mean, you know, it doesn't make much sense from that perspective. And going back to Germany, do you really think that Germany can go joint and severally liable to pick up the tab for all of the profligate Southern European countries? But people will ask, <laughs> why should we? Well, exactly. The voters are going to be outraged and you're going to see protests in the street. I'm sure that you're seeing or they're having protests there and they don't have them televised regularly. And then there's the trillion dollar question, China. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> How, I mean, if there, uh, there is another collapse, it is bound to affect China, is it not? I mean, it's tied in or, or can it sort of survive? Well. China will always survive because if you think about how many people are yeah, in China. Yeah, it's a huge market, internal market. It's, it's absolutely gigantic. But yeah. if you think about their accounting principles, they're fraudulent. So, I mean, their GDP is not anywhere near 7% that they're reporting because if you look at the mismatch between the amount of electricity they're using and power and commodities that they're using, it's probably closer to 4% or a little bit lower than that. Mm -hmm. Will there be a credit crisis in China? I believe that there will be a substantial credit crisis in China, but it's part of a growing but even though China is not as financialized as the United States or Europe. Well, if you look at the credit growth in trillions of dollars that in the past 10 years or 15 years, they've created all these ghost cities where they've got apartment building after apartment building after apartment building and they're all empty and nobody's yes. buying them. But these were all government loans. So there's been too much credit too quickly. That will end badly, but you know, if they doctor the numbers, the government can contain it for a short period of time. But eventually, you know, in any Ponzi scheme, the ride is always good, but they always all end badly. Mitch, it's a grim message, but I think it is hard-headed and realistic. It's a great pity that the politicians turn their backs on all this, isn't it? I mean, you meet politicians, uh, fairly regularly uh, in this country. I mean, do they show any signs of understanding what the scale of this thing is? I think that the biggest issue that you run into now is politics. Governance has left government. And now it appears that it's a stepping stone. If you look at Tony Blair's career, I mean, he used the Bill Clinton model of how to use politics to, to make further money your career when you get out. Now yeah. he makes 35 million and you know you see he's been involved in all these different conflicted yeah. deals going on using his office as a Middle East envoy to benefit himself financially. Yeah. So I think you know the, the takeaway is if you're a good boy and you toe the line and keep the narrative then you'll get out and be a very wealthy person. But how does that help the students how does it help the savers and how does it help future generations of our children and our children's children? I don't think it does. Mitch Feinstein, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.